So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Data and the Greater Good. It's wonderful to see all of you here. And just to briefly introduce myself, I'm Elaine Gamble, one of the co-organizers of Data and the Greater Good. Uh, I started out attending the meetings. I really enjoyed them, and I guess I asked one too many questions, and then I was asked if I would uh, help to uh, organize the meetups, which I really enjoyed. And we've had some of the most phenomenal organizations in the world come and talk to us about their passion and for data, their data journey, and how they're using data in transformational ways. And those organizations include Lincoln Center, the 92nd Street Y, uh, we've had the Public Art Fund in, Cooper Hewitt, DonorsChoose.org, and uh, New York Cares, and a number of other phenomenal organizations. And we're really honored to have with us tonight um, Jake Garcia from Candid. Jake is Vice President of Data and Technology at Candid. And Candid's focus is being a single source of data to support the fundraising goals of nonprofit organizations, having a one-stop resource for information that enables not-for-profits to raise money more efficiently and effectively. And we're really honored to have Jake here with us tonight. He has a very distinguished background. As Vice President of Data and Technology at Candid, he's responsible for leading and integrating six sub-departments related to data and technology. And those departments include application development, web design, data discovery, data management, insights, uh, and system services. He oversees a number of individuals in data visualization and mapping, machine learning, uh, among others. As a geographer and programmer, he has worked with some of the world's most renowned organizations, including Al Gore's Climate Project, NASA, as well as the City of New York and the US Army. He received his master's degree from Hunter College in geography and his bachelor's degree from Brown University. Please give Jake a very warm welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jake. Uh, you know, when I put together this slide deck, uh, I kind of imagined that the focus of it would be data for fundraising. But as I talked to a few of you, I realized there's a lot of other cases for data, data science, data analysis. So, uh, you know, I'll go a little bit deeper than I normally would on some of these topics to make sure we kind of cover the bases. And then uh, feel free at the end or during, raise your hand to ask questions and see what, you know, how I can um, help make some of this stuff clearer. <clears throat> so, and I, I kind of skipped over this, I don't know why, but so, see it says Foundation Center on top, says now candid.org. This was my kind of uh, bargaining with myself about not accepting the fact that the name of our company changed or nonprofit changed. Basically, we were called uh, Foundation Center, and we started in the 1950s. Uh, and the idea was to, to make the world of foundations a lot more transparent because they were accused back in the 50s uh, by McCarthy and McCarthyism of being, um, you know, helping, helping communism take hold in, in, in America. So the idea of having transparent data about foundations was to show, look, they're just working on things related to poverty or economic development or other things. Well, later on, uh, you know, in, I guess in the 90s, uh, guidestar.org started up and there are two separate organizations that were basically kind of two sides of the same coin at the time, uh, GuideStar collects data on nonprofits in the United States and a lot of their fiscal information and stuff about their, their, you know, their financials and about staffing, whereas Foundation, collected, Foundation Center collected data on foundations and nonprofits who received grants from those foundations. So what we're looking at here, and this is one of the things, this, this is Foundation Maps. This shows kind of one of the snapshots of the data from Foundation Center Classic, that's what we're calling it still, Foundation Center Classic and GuideStar Classic. We still haven't all called ourselves just candid yet. But basically in the data set, there's, you know, 16 point, there's evidence of 16.1 million transactions. We're not actually processing the transactions. We have the data about the transactions. From 167,000 funders around the world, these kind of teal bubbles are, are foundations. Now, it's, it's scaled a little funny, but basically most of them are in the United States, several in the UK, but there's also a sprinkling of them in, in other countries. Um, and I'll get into some more detail about that. One of the things that we also do is some, uh, in addition to some of the data science, also a little bit of network analysis. What this is, uh, these orange bubbles are, um, are nonprofits who receive grants, and the teal bubbles are foundations who have given the grants. 
And this is kind of like six degrees of Kevin Bacon kind of thing. And I think this particular case, I don't remember what this what exactly was. Uh, this is uh, brunts of Brazilian uh, nonprofits. And you can see that the Ford Foundation is very active in Brazil, but they also share uh, grantees in common with uh, the Gates Foundation and with the Mott Foundation and, and some of these other ones. And typically, the use case for this kind of thing is, you, let's say you've got a conference about water, sanitation, and hygiene. And I'll show a demo of this toward the end. Um, you can actually see how, wh where the overlap of funding is. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of nonprofits and foundations who actually kind of work together and are funding some of the same organizations, and they wouldn't have known that without something, something like this. So as of February, we became candid, and, and the overall number, we've got 250 staff, but data tech the department that I run, we've got you know, a, an embarrassingly large number of geographers for a nonprofit, um, and that was partly, it was my fault, but um, they're really programmers, then we started making more maps, and it was pretty cool. Three data scientists, a bunch of designers, a lot of programmers. Um, we have 13 uh, Agile Sprint teams working on uh, multiple different projects for internal and external uh, purposes. These are the main products um, and services. Foundation Directory Online is the main place to go when people are looking for, for grants. You're a nonprofit, you're trying to figure out who would be the best funder for me. GuideStar is when you're a funder, you want to find out, are, am I allowed to give this nonprofit uh, a grant? Or, you know, I'm thinking about giving money as an individual to this nonprofit. Are they actually legitimate? Do you know, they have a good track record? Uh, do they have staff? That kind of thing. Foundation Maps is the one I just showed. That's for, for scanning the landscape. And then there's one that, that, for those of you who are in the nonprofit sector might know, we abbreviate it as PND. It's Philanthropy News Digests. It's a relatively popular uh, news service with kind of uh, an aggregate um, curated uh, news source for, for American uh, philanthropy. So these are the questions that we get a lot. And I kind of highlighted this one in white because it, it was the one that comes up probably the most often. But this, there's one term, like how can I scan the landscape of funding? And, and I thought when I first got into the, to, to the sector like 10 years ago, I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand what it meant. And, and, I, and now I do, it's just, a, I don't know why everybody uses the term scan the landscape. Because they don't always mean they want to actually look at the land or map of something. They just want to know who are the biggest funders, who are the biggest nonprofits, who, who's the most active in this space. And so you'll, you'll hear that term a lot. I'm trying to scan, I'm, I'm doing a landscape scan. You know, they're just getting some aggregate information. Um, who else should I partner with? We're hearing a lot of this from foundations and nonprofits. A lot of foundations are starting to fund nonprofits, and they'll say, well, I'm not going to just give you a check for a million dollars. I'll give you a check for $500,000. Can you get another foundation to give you the other part? Because we want to make sure that we're not the only ones funding you. Or we'll say, we'll give you some money, but you've got to find another nonprofit to do something else because that, that, you, you can't, we can't give you all of the money. It, just, it happens a lot more, and collaboration, luckily, is happening a lot more in the field. And then there's this one about regions that need the most help. Imagine you're a funder, you've got a couple million dollars, and you think you know everything you need to know, and then you realize, you know what, I just spent $5 million in Ghana, and I didn't even realize that there's already a bunch of other funders doing this, but Burkina Faso is in much worse shape and nobody's active there right now. So they, they do start to ask the question after they kind of get involved and what, you know, what data can actually help with that. For those of you who are lucky enough to have been in the, in, in, around the nonprofit world, you'll know the 990 form. It is, um, I mean, when it comes right down to it, it is super boring. Uh, it basically has a lot of basic information. It's a requirement for American nonprofits and foundations to file 990s. And it's got basic information, and it could be, a, could be hundreds of pages long, it could be a couple pages long. Uh, this is a Cleveland Foundation, which is a grant-making public charity. And as you can tell, it's relatively clean, it's probably machine-readable, uh, or if you OCR, it's probably fine. But there's a lot of them that are actually handwritten, and then they come to us and they have to be OCR'd and then we gotta process them, and so that's one of the reasons why when we became candid is one thing. There's roughly 400 to 500,000 of these files, you know, five to 100 pages long each that need to be OCR'd and done, you know, quality controlled every year, and then another 500,000 to, well, that's, that's a, maybe 1.5 million, roughly, that are already machine, machine readable. Now this is another example, and I, and I put this on here just to show, like this is, when I imagine the data that comes from the nonprofit sector, I imagine the data would show up like this. There's a couple things that are really great about this. 
One is every institution here they gave a grant to has a unique identifier. That's kind of nice. Everything has a dollar amount and it's relatively you know, normalized here. And there's a description about the, what the grant is for. Unfortunately, this is extremely rare. Usually we get the name of the institution with a malformed address, no unique identifier. Uh, maybe may, we we're assuming because this is a C3, this is US dollars. But you know that's not always clear, and then sometimes the descriptions don't exist. Like this one is very popular. There, of the four million grants that get made every year in the United States, general support is on about 30% of them, or something that says for support. So if it's to a university, it says for support, you have no idea what it's really for. Uh, you guys know this. I don't have to explain this. This is just the this is, well, this is XML, but this is the the IRS is one of the new formats for the data they're providing. So a lot of the stuff that we do that requires some of the, the kind of heavier lifting to kind of make the data more, more usable and more valuable is, is some machine learning and, and natural language processing methods, auto classification, auto geocoding, entity extraction, entity matching, predicting giving, and, the, and we have this news data pipeline, which is pretty cool, and I can demo that later. We've got a classification system, and this is the top level of the subjects of the classification system. If we were to drill into this, under sciences, you know, there's biology and chemistry and physics and a bunch of other sciences. And under that, there's another level. Imagine that for, there's also for education, for health, a bunch of things. So one of the things that we've got to do, uh, there's also the sustainable development goals. So imagine we get text in like this, and we're doing it at a pretty large scale with millions of chunks of text like this a year in grants and over uh, 300,000 news articles every night. And what we're doing is we need to basically categorize everything into our taxonomy. So imagine, we, and we, what we used to do, is we used to have people uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s would go to DC, get the 990 form, take a picture of it, come back, process the film, give it to somebody to read, and they'd say, where does this fit in the taxonomy? And they'd say, ah, oh, it's water, sanitation, and hygiene. So you could only do a certain, you'd do a small amount, it's manual, and then you have to be an expert. But what we have is we've got millions of these things that have been hand coded by experts. And so now we can build auto classification algorithms. So now we can do this at scale. So now it basically comes out and says, you know, and, and we can do hundreds of thousands of these in less than a minute at about 85% uh, precise with about 70% recall, meaning if it guesses something, it's likely to be right, but it'll miss some also. So w w what's the worst problem? So since we're not diagnosing a, a, a disease for someone, do they, or do they or do they not have cancer? That'd be pretty, you don't, want, you don't want bad problems with precision or recall. For categorizing a piece of text about something that happened two years ago, I mean, we, we're a little bit more tolerant for error. Uh, but basically what happens is this piece of data would now be available to anybody who's looking for things related to Bangladesh and water access, sanitation, and hygiene. And this is the problem that we, we used to only process the data from the really big foundations. So everything was skewed toward Gates and Ford and Mott and Hewlett and all the really big ones that are kind of name brands. And now we're processing data from all the foundations in the United States and, uh, and 50,000 outside of the United States. There's also weird things that happen. There's, in the SDGs, I don't know if you guys know the Sustainable Development Goals, there's only 16, 17 of them. And people have a hard time saying, well, where do I fit into the SDGs, a nonprofit or foundation? It's like, well, one's about health, one's about education, one's about life above on land, one's about life in the water. They're very simple, but for some reason, people find it very gratifying to copy and paste their mission statement and see where it shows up in the SDGs. And this one is like, well, look, there's a clean water sanitation one. So it's, to me, it's not that hard, but again, people don't want to spend time learning taxonomies. They just want to put data in, get something out, put in a bucket and then go on and see who else is, who else is kind of in their similar bucket, basically. And then there's indicators that you can also then rank. Um, again, if you have questions about SDGs, we can go into that. It's a kind of a subset of uh, international uh, data uh, standard. So when we look at the data that's been auto-classified into these buckets, and this is a little thing called the windrows, and I can, I'll do a demo of this in a little bit. Basically, you can start to see um, this is uh, grants for activities in Brazil starting in 2006. We can see that the largest amount of funding is going for the environment, international relations and human rights, and a little bit of community and economic development. Not so much on arts and culture, uh, and not as much on, on public safety. But if you do this across the board, and you say, okay, well, what's going on in Dallas? What's going on in Houston? What's going on in there? You'll see actually a different spread of this, of this information which can be relevant, especially if you're going into that location and you're about to, like, for instance, religion, zero. Doesn't mean that there should be more. 
it's not implying anything like that at all. It just shows that there's no, no, no trace of activity related to that um, that we know of so far. Then you can also then categorize this into the sustainable development goals too. So we also have uh, auto geocoding, which also extracts any of the text that's about, uh, you know, it says this is for Ghana, that's pretty straightforward. There's only, really only one Ghana that I know of, and at least only one very popular one. But uh, you probably know from, from The Simpsons, the Springfield problem, there's like 19 or 20 or something Springfields. And if you get a piece of data that says, for that, that big project in Springfield, you know, like, well, which, which one is it? That's actually kind of a hard problem to solve. There's no other context around it. But luckily, most places are not as commonly named as Springfield, or at least they'll have some other context in the sentence. But the idea is you want to be able to get a geographic kind of spread of where the activities are happening. So being able to auto-classify the text by subject and then auto-geocode it uh, is also really important. In the end, as disappointing as it is for as a geographer, in the end, people don't really care about this at all. And this makes me sad. I mean, I, when I, we've got demographics, I can get down to like the, the, uh, the demographics inside a couple of city blocks and see where the nonprofits are. And again, I can demo that if we want to. But in the end, what really counts for 95% of people is this list. Who are the biggest funders for this area that support my, my area of interest? So in this case, is just human rights. And Ford, and you've got the National Postcode Lottery in Amsterdam, and you've got the US, the US Department of State. But imagine that you're working in Poughkeepsie, and you're working on youth development. You want to know who the biggest funders are, because those are the ones who are going to be your targets for, for, for fundraising. So getting that list is the thing that most people come to us for. Or maybe it's who are the biggest nonprofits, or who are the most active, or who's given the most grants. Or let's say you're only looking for a grant of $5,000 or something. You want to, who, are the, who are the biggest small, who are the, who are the most regular small funders? Uh, who work in there. There's different ways of slicing and dicing the data. But basically these lists, these prospect lists, is really where, where people come to us uh, for. Uh, There's again more about the um, GRA served. I was giving a presentation in Amsterdam, decided to show them all the nonprofits that are in, in Amsterdam um, doing, working on ed education. Again, we've got this, uh, you know, for all over the world. Um, again, this is a, a funding list of, based on sustainable development goals. Then you also have lists of the largest nonprofits who are active. So just like using the network model of seeing all, how all these foundations and nonprofits are interconnected, you might also want to know, okay, who are the biggest nonprofits working on this and where, you know, who should I be connecting with because they might have some kind of overlapping interest and overlapping funders. Um, again, here's, oh, here's my Ghana case. Okay, this is a good one. I was gonna demo this, but this is, I'm glad I have this one up already. Okay, this is a network model related to quality education where the geographic area is served, meaning the nonprofits could be anywhere in the world, but the projects they're working are in Ghana. So what we can see here is we can see, all right, the MasterCard Foundation is connected to this nonprofit, connected to Educational Pathways, connected to a, a Corey Foundation. Vanguard uh, is connected to Ashesi University, connected to Fidelity, you know, they're all kind of connected. They all kind of, you can imagine them kind of hanging out at the same kind of events and parties. But well, there's just one here that's all by themselves, the Koch Foundation. Now the Koch Foundation gives to all these different nonprofits, but nobody else in this group gives to these nonprofits. And if we were to hover over them, you'd see things like Saint, 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 Saint. they're all basically religious nonprofits, basically, basically religious charities. Now it doesn't mean that they're qualitatively or quantitatively any different than anybody else. It just means they've got their own network that a lot of these guys, when they go to the same events, they're not aware that there's this group and they're disconnected, that they actually you know, are part of the landscape of what's going on related to education in, in Ghana. All right, so now we get to the part that's my, my biggest probably pet peeve when it comes to uh, the data and, and what I'm really championing for now that we're, we're at, um, now that the, now the two organizations have merged. There's this like data cliff that exists. So when you think about a file, that, uh, a, 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 something gets filed from the IRS, let's say your 2019 990 talks about all the grants you made. Well, you're not gonna file that until next spring. The IRS is gonna turn that around and make that available maybe next fall, maybe in 2021. Then we gotta take the data and process it, put it all through the steps and match it and do all the other things we gotta do with it. 
Well, that means that in 2020, right now, or 2019 rather, we have this really tiny amount of data. And for 2018, we have about this amount of data. For 2017, it's like kind of, this is dollar value, sorry. We have, we have a lot of data for like recent past, but we have very little data for, sorry, up until 2016, 2017. Then it kind of drops off for recent. So there's a huge gap. We know there's a bunch more activity happening here, but we don't know what it is. So the goal is to get as much data as we can that's freshly, that's hot off the presses, have whatever way we can. Self-submitted data is one way of doing it, but it's still, we only have, we have about 75,000 nonprofits giving us their data every year and about 1,500 foundations. But there's 2.6 million nonprofits in the United States and 150,000 foundations. So we're talking about, we have about 1% less of all the, of all the, the, uh, the nonprofits that could be giving us data. Get all the data, code the taxonomy, and also spread it so it's not so biased toward the United States. So, what we're doing now is news scraping. And I have this one up as an example, but I can show you stuff that we have from basically from, from yesterday or today. And imagine this, and this is, good, this is an example of the kind of thing that we really find really valuable. And this says, okay, and I bolded some of the things in here that are important. Next Gen Committee of the Ray C. Anderson Foundation has issued a call for proposals. This means they'll let you apply for money for $90,000 to work in 2019 to reduce the concentration of greenhouse gas emissions. By, okay, so basically what we need to do, match this organization to a real organization in our database and find the other context about the Ray C. Anderson Foundation. We also need to be able to code this to one of the climate change codes and also recognize that First of all, that of the 400,000, 300,000 articles that come out every night that we've got access to, that this is about philanthropy, that it's also about an RFP, so it's not a past grant, it's about a future grant, and that it's about these things and, and look at the other things, and also make sure we didn't double, triple, quadruple count it on accident. So this is where a lot of the um, data science stuff really kind of kicks in. Uh, AWS fans out there, lovely, fun. More, how could there be more? There's lots of it. So one of the things, and this is again a little bit older, but I've been reusing this. One of the things that we're doing is basically going in and collecting all this stuff, and now there's a lot more information. Like there's you know, news about federal grants being made, all kinds of stuff that's happening, and then we're ranking some of the information to see, to understand exactly how relevant it is. So before I go into a demo of anything, um, Basically, in an ideal world, everybody would report electronically in a standard format, but anybody who knows ever collected data knows that that's a pipe dream. Um, and they give it to us all the time. That's right out of the presses. And they give us unique identifiers, and they give us great descriptions, but they don't. And that's just, that's the nature of the world. So what we're doing is using machine learning and um, some of this big data stuff, basically, to, so that we can show all of these things, so that we can help figure out these questions. So we're finding that we're able to dramatically increase the scale and the quality of, you know, of the data um, by using some of these methods and hopefully helping figure out some of those, some of those problems. So if, you, if we still have a few minutes, I can do a demo of something and just show something in real time real quick. So I'm gonna be over here and I might just talk a little bit loudly because I don't know if I can navigate it with. So this is the, uh, thank you. So this is the news scrape, if you guys can see this. This is the thing that, that shows data, basically, that just came out in the last couple of days. And this is basically looking at Rockefeller, but if we went here, we can see, just from the last couple of days, there's 3,400 3, news articles that came out that somehow relate to nonprofits and philanthropy. So it looked at 400, 500, 600,000 articles. We've got something that trained it, that basically looked, reads all the text and tries to determine, is it about nonprofits? And then we have human beings or analysts can actually, oops, sorry. I knew that was gonna happen. One of the ways that we do some quality control is after we, we run this, we actually allow users to then, in, in our internal users to evaluate, is it about philanthropy, is it about a grant, is it an RFP, et cetera. Another problem we have, a classic data science kind of problem is, we've got a lot of data that's about uh, American Indians uh, Native Americans, but we actually don't have a lot of data that's coded for Indian Americans. And those are the same two words, but flipped. 
And so basically it codes anything with the word Indian and American as Native American, but it's highly offensive when you're looking at something like that and you're looking for a very specific thing and you find like totally wrong things. It's like we're just propagating the, the mistake Columbus made a long time ago all over, the, all over the place. So we're trying to get so that we have people that can go in and evaluate quickly, yes and no, yes, no, yes, no, and that actually helps train the models. So we can see here, just looking at these, these titles, local economy is a driver of top foundations. Philanthropists bench women of color, this is a New York Times article came out yesterday. Virginia Health Foundation, American College of Sports Medicine. So these are pretty good. And then the organizations are extracted. We can see that Salvation Army, United Nation, Chick-fil-A Foundation, Gates Foundation are the top organizations mentioned. Filter by any of these things. And the geographies then can be extracted and then they roll up by the hierarchy. So Poughkeepsie would roll up to whatever county that's in, to the state, to the, to the country, and then the continent. So that's pretty cool. And then um, let's show, I'm gonna show you guys, and this is one thing we're, we're gonna release hopefully next year, which is, we're calling it Candid Daily, but the idea is that um, we wanna look and see if there's any information that just came out and added to our databases yesterday, even if it's kind of, uh, even if the data's old, if it was new to us, it'd be new to you. So this is, if say you're working on disasters and emergency management, what are the RFPs that were released yesterday and recently in the news? Which nonprofits have been recently updated related to disasters? Which funders have just been updated uh, related to disasters? And then what about their social media presence? So that's pretty cool. But let me get to show you guys maps. I know it's gonna log me out and I'm gonna log back in. I'll show you guys that case, my favorite case of uh, Ghana. So we go to funders. Let's go, sorry, I'm gonna go to areas served. Do it, buddy. I'm gonna go to Ghana. And you can see here, if we look generally speaking at Ghana, that most of the stuff that's going to Ghana is about health and economic development. And if I did uh, change it up, I'll do water, access, sanitation, and hygiene. Go to look at the list. I'll see our good buddies. This thing kind of floats around. It's sometimes fun, but sometimes very annoying. Um, I think they're here. Coke Foundation, here they are. They give $154,000. And you can see here, it's Diocese of St. John the Evangelist, Our Lady of, etc. cetera, St. Michael's. So it's an example of the network. So, okay, that'll be it. So basically the idea is these things exist and there's different ways of getting into the data, but in order for the data to get there in the first place, we have to use a lot of the big data and data, uh, data mining uh, methods. Anyway, that's it. Thank you guys. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions? Hey, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I thought it was awesome. Um, I have two really quick questions and one that's a little bit more in depth. First, for the NLP, I was just curious what libraries you're using. Is it just NLTK or is it Spacey? Or? Uh, we're primarily using, we're doing support vector machines. Um, and I don't remember exactly which library it is, but I, or libraries, I think we're using a couple of different things. And there's technically speaking 17 different models for different levels of the taxonomy. Um, we do use a lot of NLTK, and then for entity extraction, we use Stanford, Stanford's entity extraction model, uh, which is pretty simple, but it works pretty well. Um, I will get back to you about the exact models. I, know it's, I just know it's SVM, okay. but I don't remember exactly which flavor of SVM that we ended up using. Okay, no problem, I was just, I was just curious. But the second question is, I was just curious what tech you're using to make the graphs. The graphs are really cool. I just, I don't have a lot of graphing experience, so I was just curious about that. Uh, this is uh, D3. Oh, you're doing it. Uh, and then we're using NetworkX in the background. NetworkX is like a Python library. Okay. And then for these charts, this was like slightly customized, um, slightly customized D3. It's awesome. I, I would never have the patience to learn D3, but that, that, it is awesome. Um, yeah, I used to be a JavaScript programmer, so oh, I was like, so. yes, everything should be JavaScript, obviously. Right, right. So super easy. Um, and then just my last question was um, for the NLP and higher classifying. Could you just speak about a little bit of the feature engineering you're doing? Yeah. Um, what's the best way to describe it? Well, some, 
You know, when, when we did feature engineering for some of the grants that got codes, there were a lot of grants that um, had text, let's say the sentences, to build a school in Detroit. Well, and I got coded as education, great. But there are some funders, for instance, who said, okay, this is for a basketball program. And then they said, no, 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 don't code it to basketball. Code this to religion. This is a religious grant. I'm like, what? But it's, a, but it's totally about basketball. I'm like, no. So what we did, we had a feature engineer take anything out that's crazy, and that, that religion's crazy, that they coded it to something that you can't intuit from the text. Take those out. So there are a lot of individual coders and a lot of individual data sets that we felt like we couldn't trust that weren't gonna be kind of be a golden record. So we did a lot of that. We also had to do a lot of ingram, bigram kind of stuff because there's a lot of obviously different ways of saying things and written all kinds of different, different ways. Um, we're not yet, we do have auto classifiers for non-English, but it's, we, it's all another version of, we don't have a lot of non-English speaking folks, so what we're trying to do is we can auto-translate into English and, and try to, to uh, auto-classify them, but we haven't actually built separate auto-classifiers for different languages yet. Um, and then we, we have to do a lot of, basically, of cleanup of the data, and one of the weirdest, weird, the, hard, the hardest thing to control for is, you know, abbreviations um, and a few other kind of quirks of, of, of the data. Uh, the, well, the thing that we had that was kind of cool is the news, the news one that was cool is we had Plant Through News Digest, we had 10,000 articles that were all picked by staff over the years of being philanthropy. And then we just took a huge bundle from this thing called GDELT, which is a big news repository. We just took like a million of those and said, okay, these might be about philanthropy, but they might not. I don't know. Mostly they're not. Here's a bunch that are, and we trained the model and it was like extremely precise. So we were pretty happy about that. And then now we've got people saying yes and no about the rest. So we're just getting them where we, where we can. So we're trying, to, we're trying to clean it as good as we could, then auto-classify it, and then have experts do a couple of minor things toward the end to kind of keep trying to improve it. And we, I mean, we had tons of resistance because you know, we used to be an institution that created books. And the books had to be perfect when you printed the book. And now it's like, well, SVM changes. If it improves, we might recode all the data. You know? And it's like some people really freak out about that. So what we're trying to do is get them in the mix by helping with feature engineering, feature basic quality by, you know, by being you know, quality people, by, by putting uh, you know, codes, uh, you know, hand coding them. And then that it buys them in and they can see over time the precision recall improving even, even uh, incrementally. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? Sure, sure. So we, you know, we have, like what I was describing earlier, we've got people on staff who are you know, experts in classifying data into one of uh, 900 different uh, subject codes. Like here, we're, we're into, I don't know what subcategory of economic development this is, but it's got all these different hierarchies, and there's also population codes. And so what we do is we auto-classify it, try to auto-classify it to as, as specific a code as we can, but if it can't guess which science it is, it might just guess science. Um, like some things are new, like um, blockchain, for instance. We don't have any grants made about blockchain, and there's no blockchain code, but we do know that blockchain is associated with technology. So we can at least try to get them auto-classified into something that's near the right bucket, even if there's not there's a very sparse signal about it. We also have some codes that have very little data on them. So basically those mean that we really are not very good at coding to them because you need like a thousand or something things that, that basically kind of imply a certain other code. So um, we, we had a foundation come to us recently and they had a taxonomy of a hundred things. They said uh, there were just a hundred things, they weren't, there was no parents and child relationships. They had a hundred different categories of things. We said, well, how much data do you have for these? And they had, they had 50 of them that had no data. <coughs> Nothing, so how could you auto-classify something into those things with no training, training materials? So it was, it, you know, we, we run into that kind of thing a lot. People are like, oh, I want you to code my, this stuff into my categories, but you really do need the training, the training data. So for the, um, you know, basically imagine we had uh, two million sentences, each of those sentences coded to one of a thousand different categories, and for that, that's how we, that's what we use for training for the auto -class. We, it was part of the process in order to cleanse and improve the data so that the auto classifier would get, have better um, results. 
Yeah, clean. I mean, I, I don't know what the that the what the inside thing is. Was it eighty percent of data science is is feature engineering? So yeah, you you got to clean the data. Unfortunately, it's it's a. Uh, some people like it. <laughs> I have a question, Jake. Um, in serving on a nonprofit board, um, one of the discussions we have about fundraising is that it just seems the number of foundations is declining, or uh, they're fleeting. A foundation will, will be in place, and then a short time later, it's not ex non-existent. And I wanted to know if you would agree with that assessment, and if so, how might that pose challenges for fundraising, and, and also to the service or the value that you provide? The number, the number of foundations goes up by about 5% every year, but there's a lot of foundations that are not staffed. There's also a lot of foundations like the Trump Foundation, which isn't actually a foundation. Uh, but there, there's, so that, but it's not necessarily they're all attack shelters or all, but they just might be small and unstaffed. So uh, I think there's one, the, the Case Foundation. I just saw an email today, they're gonna stop making grants. So some foundations will take their, okay, I've got a million dollars, I've got a billion dollars, whatever it is, and they're gonna spin down. So Atlantic Philanthropy is spent down. Uh, there's another big foundation that, that they're, they're basically spending that means we're, we're gonna take all of our assets, we're gonna spend it in the form of grants, and we're gonna close up shop in a year and a half or something like that. And it does happen. Um, the other thing that's kind of weird is that for fundraising for nonprofits, it's usually, I think on average, it's something like 15 or 20 percent of the revenue for nonprofits is from foundations. The rest of it primarily comes from earned income and from individual donors. So individual donors make up a much larger percentage of, of nonprofit revenue than foundations do. So there, we, we te teach at, at Candid uh, in our New York office, there's classes on how to do fundraising. And basically it's like, when you get back to the list, the list view is kind of where you start and you get your list and then you prospect and then you gotta find out who you know there. So you do a LinkedIn kind of thing, which I didn't get into people, but people processing is the next level. It's really unfortunate that GDPR and CCPA are coming out now, because I'm not sure how far we're gonna get with our people tracking, but the idea is if you are three degrees of separation from a person, you're way more likely to get a grant from that foundation than you, than you would be if you didn't know anybody at all. Because, I, again, I don't know the statistics on top of my head, but for well, why we're we emphasizing the request for proposal that comes from foundation, they're saying, hey, $90,000 is available, you, you know, you guys should apply for it now. I think it's only something like somewhere between 10 and 20% of foundations have any program at all that's got an open RFP. The rest of them, you've got to know somebody. Because they don't, they, because what happens when you have a foundation, typically, this is, my, this is kind of a cynical view about it, but it's informed, at least, uh, is that a foundation, well, let's say they've got a billion dollars, and they'll say, we're gonna work on a couple of things. We're gonna work on economic development and we're gonna work on uh, health. And I interviewed a bunch of foundations that work on economic development in the Bronx. And before we built Foundation Maps, and I was like, would you be surprised to find more players, nonprofits and foundations, doing economic development in the Bronx? They said, there aren't any, I know them all. And when you actually show them the data, they're like, oh yeah, but they don't count. You know, so there's like, there's a, what usually happens is foundations hire experts. The experts are expected to know what they need to know, and they don't really go fishing around. Nonprofits are very, very aggressive. They're very eager. They look everywhere in every nook and cranny for funding. Funders don't really have that incentive. You have to really wake up and really care every day that you're going to find out something new. Or you just be like, I know who I'm going to give the money to. We're going to write the checks, make sure they do a good job, et cetera, et cetera. They're not fishing as much as nonprofits do on the other side. So it is a, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a black art, the art of fundraising from foundations. You really have to have a combination of social acuity, data to back you up, and then figure out a way to get in with these folks and make your case to them because they're not always super open to it. Not that they're closed, but they're mostly used to people coming to them asking for money and they're used to saying no. So it takes a lot of, of craftiness to get, to get through those barriers. Other questions? Oh, sorry. Excuse my ignorance, but do, do, do you guys earn revenue from, how, how, how are you getting paid? Good question. I, and it's on our 990, so it's, uh, there's no secrets uh, here. Um, it's roughly, we, we, we're about a $40 million a year nonprofit. $20 million of that comes from uh, subscription products, meaning like uh, this and Foundation Directory Online and Guidestar Pro. Another few million uh, comes in from special projects. Um, 
somebody will like the Ford Foundation wants us to go get all the data about nonprofits in India. We'll go we'll go do that, and that's you know get grant money to do that one-off project. Um, and then another you know third comes from general support. So we have like if you go to our library, we call a library in our office down on, on near Wall Street on Old Slip. That's free to the public. Uh, people can use our stuff for free there, and so we do. And that we have locations, uh, 400 library locations around the country, where people can go and use our stuff for free, and so that's kind of subsidized. And we also do a lot of free reports, so we get so roughly a third of our revenues from foundations, uh, who who just want us to keep doing a lot of things we do. So earned revenue is, is, is substantial. Earned re so subscription products plus custom projects is like 60, 65 percent of. of and that's from nonprofits and foundations who are paying your subscription service to, to be able to do this searching. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So in some corporations too, sometimes we do have some like uh, groups of foundations, groups of nonprofits, or uh, like collections of uh, accountants and lawyers who, oh, they're trying to market to, trying to get you know, clients from, the, to, from large nonprofits and foundations. Let's see, who, is all, who are all the hospitals, the nonprofit hospitals in California who do cancer research and they want to try to get access and try to advertise to them that way. But the vast majority is, is foundations and nonprofits. Any other questions? You may not feel you need a mic, but for the recording, it's a lot easier for us to hear you if you use the mic. Here? Hello, um, I have a couple questions. So, one is, um, so what is your intentionality? Like, is there uh, an ultimate goal to kind of like route funds to countries that need it most, most, or like uh, funds that need it most? Well, if you're asking candid at large. <laughs> there's a different answer than what I how I would answer it. I think. Um, let me see if I can demonstrate this, and it might make the point kind of clear. Um, let's see. I'll do another query in Foundation Maps. There's a lot of folks who have a different kind of different perspectives on this um, at, at Candid, and they're all they're all right, you know, in in a way. Um, Okay, so this is overall funding in here, and there's like billions of dollars everywhere, but if we look at, um, where's science on here? Projected? Lugin. I'm a little colorblind too, so it doesn't help me. Oh, here we go. Okay, so science is here. Science is like really low, and some things like arts are really high. But what you'll find is you don't want to say, oh, stop spending money on museums and start putting money into biochemistry or whatever. So, but, but typically you'll see that some things are underfunded, but I just happen to know the science is better than I know the arts, for instance. Um, there are folks who want to see more funding going toward um, more things related to diversity, equity, and inclusion related to, in, in the United States particularly. Um, but what our main goal is transparency. So when there's more transparency, we want people, we want funders to make the most informed decisions and nonprofits to, to spend the money wisely and, have to, and report good out, and outcomes about what they do, but without putting on a value judgment about where, you know, who you should give money to. That, there's a lot of, for instance, we did a project about democracy funding, and democracy funding was not about uh, politics necessarily, it was about voter education, uh, you know, other kinds of initiatives that are not political, but just really for the, in the nonprofit world. But uh, the more liberal ones wanted to call uh, this one category voter suppression, and the conservative foundations wanted to call it voter integrity. So, you know, we we're like, okay, we can have our own opinion about it, but we'll label it a certain way and make sure the information is there and try to be as objective about it as possible so people can make their own decision. So th there's not very, as much value judgment as there's that might appear. Okay, uh, that was an excellent answer, thank you. Uh, all right, so a little separate question here. I know you mentioned that um, most uh, most charities or nonprofits get their money through people, and, and that obviously it's a struggle to get grants because you kind of have to know someone. Is there any work going on in like advertising and trying to use user data to directly target people with a lot of money to get to the charities that you think need it most? Well, one thing that we're doing that, that seems to be working, I, and I only have anecdotal evidence of this, in Gui and I didn't show any of the GuideStar stuff, and I know that some, some folks here use GuideStar to evaluate charities, but there is a way, if you submit your own data, you get a badge level. 
So there's bronze, which means you put in very basic information about yourself. There's silver, gold, that means more. And then platinum means that you put in a lot of information about your outcomes. Say we fed 135 children and these people's lives improved because we did all these things. And so some foundations and nonprofits, some foundations are saying, if you want to apply for a grant, you've got to be silver or above with GuideStar. Or non you can filter it in the application and say, I only want things that have a, a large amount of high quality data about them. So that seems anecdotally to, to benefit them when they're doing fundraising. Uh, but again, it's, it's about uh, trying to encourage more data and more presentation about themselves and, and not less. One more quick question. Is that it for questions? Okay, well, Jake, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys.